So having decided what you would like to be included in your definition of scientific thinking, let's carry on. And this is a suggested postscript on the thinking skills. And uh, what I'm suggesting is primary school science teachers can help address the damaging disengagement from and criticism of analytical thinking in our education system. And I would say now society in a small way, oh there I do say, and perhaps make a society a more thoughtful and honest place. This is related to scientific thinking or analytical thinking. I read this article, uh, what it's almost two years ago, about uh, a teacher in Helensburg in uh, the, the uh, Illawarra region near Wollongong who had got into uh, quite a lot of trouble for the class having written to the Minister of uh, Immigration, I think, about children in detention. Um, I don't know enough about the story to know whether the teacher was out of line or not, uh, whether it was a political act in which case it was wrong or whether it was simply the students deciding to um, uh, exercise their right to have an opinion. But it got me thinking and then I saw this a year later. A Q&A program and something happened and I thought, wow, this is important, this is significant. And I just, I cut out the parts of the Q&A program that are relevant and I want to show them to you now. Our next question comes from Liza Hildreth. A 2013 Lowy Institute poll suggested that a majority of young Australians are ambivalent about the virtues of democracy. As a high school teacher and an advocate of active, informed participation in the political system, how can I best encourage my students to not only participate in the democratic process, but help them to see the value of it and help to shape it in the future? Part of your argument. I want to hear from the politicians this evening, though, as well. Mike Dreyfus? Uh, Liza, I think it's a great question, and I think participate. Uh, which but is how? Something... How? Um, get involved. Join a political party. Uh, go and visit your local MP. Write to your local MP. Email your local MP. Party. Party. In fact, a lot of your work is about participation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm for participation, and I think it's a great message uh, to give to everyone in Australia, but particularly young people, that it's worth participating. That's the, that's the real point. But, but surely... <laughs> yeah, yeah, get, get involved in order to make it work. Says the soldier. Look, I think, um, firstly, thank you for the question. I think the poll that you cited uh, is a concerning one, uh, that only about half of young people uh, are anything other than ambivalent about democracy. I think, um, you know, we need to work on that. We can look at... Uh, what parts of the system are broken and what they might be responding to. We can look at, uh, you know, what, what are some of the concerns uh, that young people might have, but certainly uh, they should get involved. We, do. And we are in interesting times uh, democratically. I think, though, um, I haven't certainly given up at all uh, on, on, on our democracy or democracy generally. I think it is by far the best system of government, so we need to make it work. Uh, and people being involved and active in that uh, is absolutely critical to that because it keeps leaders accountable, it keeps politicians accountable, uh, and it helps make the system work. There aren't enough people who are in directly involved in the political system in Australia at the moment, in my opinion. Just... So you can see that these two senior ministers, well, Mark Dreyfus is a senior minister, uh, um, Zed Zaselja is uh, or was um, a junior minister, assistant minister, but they very clearly expressed the opinion that engagement by students in the uh, democratic process, and democracy is political, so the political process was vital to the strength of our democracy. And that does not simply apply to. Uh, secondary school students, in fact it's probably really important to get primary school students involved in it if we're going to because that's the time when you have the freedom to mix subjects and, and think across areas and engage in analytical thinking. Now uh, I am definitely not suggesting that what we should become is political activists, that is completely wrong. But analytical thinking is wonderful and um, to me, it makes a lot of sense if we actually start our students to invite them to take issues of the day and analyze their thoughts about them, perhaps not even as a class, but each one uh, um, reaching their own conclusion, and then writing to someone, exercising their political right, engaging in democracy, 
writing to someone in a position of authority to say this is what I think and I would like you to consider doing what I am suggesting and I'm going to get to that again further on when we look at the uh, focus questions um, later on when we're looking at content there's a Another important video that I need to show you, there's a lot of information from outside coming into uh, this course and it's all vital because I know we haven't got to content yet, but content changes from year to year. This, this, you, this, this syllabus is content is radically different from the technology in the previous syllabus is content. Science doesn't change that rapidly, though actually these days it does. So the content is the vehicle for us to achieve the vision. And Sugata Mitra has a lot to say about the vision that we can follow in educating students. And let me give you a little bit of background to Sugata Mitra. He was working as an, an engineer, a design engineer in Delhi. Uh, this is some years ago. Um, and if you've ever been to India and to one of the major cities, you'll know that there are these beautiful buildings like the one that Sugata Mitra was working in and alongside of that there'd be a slum and then alongside of that there might be a huge area for washing clothes and then uh, some eating area and, and so there's the, there is really no playing as we have here and so Sugata Mitra's office building was actually next to a slum. He had this task of designing a terminal to be, that had to be used in uh, a, a supermarket. It was many years ago and it was a box type of terminal and instead of having uh, a normal ma mouse to make it more robust it had little levers that you, act, that you use the levers with and he had to test how it would work and he had this idea and what he did was he went down to the slum next door and knocked a hole in the wall it became known as the hole in the wall experiment and plugged this terminal in, connected it to the internet set up cameras to watch it and left and the adults uh, took very little uh, notice of it but after a little while a little uh, fellow came around and he um, he was fiddling with the with the, uh, the, 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 uh, the joysticks and uh, he could hardly reach up it was designed for adults so he was standing on his tiptoes doing this and a girl a little older than him came after uh, after been doing it for a while and he started teaching her how to use it and other kids gathered around and it became quite a thing by the end of the week they had worked out how to browse the web and were actually trying to hack into sites and Sugata Mitra thought wow this is a lot more interesting than designing terminals uh, he was invited sometime after this to give a TED talk. It was a long TED talk and I cut out the beginning of it and this is where he starts to explain about uh, the hole in the wall experiment. And all over India at the end of about two years, children were beginning to Google their homework. As a result, the teachers reported tremendous improvements in their English. <laughs> you know, rapid improvement in all sorts of things. They said they're, they've become really deep thinkers and so on and so forth. And, uh, and indeed, they had. I mean, if, if there's stuff on Google, why would you need to stuff it into your head? So at the end of the next four years, I decided that groups of children can navigate the internet to achieve educational objectives on their own. At that time, a large amount of money had come into Newcastle University um, to improve schooling in India. So Newcastle gave me a call. I said, I'll do it from Delhi. They said, there's no way you're going to handle a million pounds worth of uh, you know, university money um, uh, sitting in Delhi. So uh, in 2006, I bought myself a heavy overcoat and moved to Newcastle. <laughs> I wanted to test the limits of this system. The first experiment I did out of Newcastle was actually done in India, and I set myself an impossible target. Can Tamil-speaking 12-year-old children in a South Indian village teach themselves biotechnology in English on their own? 
And I thought, I'll test them, they'll get a zero. I'll give them material, I'll come back and test them, they'll get another zero. I'll go back and say, yes, we need teachers for certain things. I called in 26 children, they all came in there, and I told them, look, there's some really difficult stuff on this computer. I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't understand anything. Um, it's all in English, and uh, I'm, I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> so I left them with it. I came back after two months, and the 26 children marched in looking very, very quiet. I said, well, did you look at any of the stuff? I said, yes, we did. Did you understand anything? No, nothing. So I said, well, how long did you practice on it before you decided that you understood nothing? They said, we look at it every day. So I said, for two months you were looking at stuff you didn't understand. So a 12-year-old girl raises her hand and says, literally, apart from the fact that improper replication of the DNA molecule causes genetic disease, we've understood nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> It took me three years to publish that. It's just been published in the British Journal of Educational Technology. One of the referees who refereed the paper said, it's too good to be true, <laughs> which was not very nice. <laughs> well, <laughs> but the expression was not very nice. So, <laughs> so their scores had gone up from 0 to 30%, which is an educational impossibility under the circumstances. But 30% is not a pass. So I, I found that they had a friend, a local accountant, a, a young girl, and they played football with her. I asked that girl, would you teach them enough biotechnology to pass? And she said, how would I do that? I don't know the subject. I said, no, use the method of the grandmother. She said, what's that? I said, well, what you've got to do is stand behind them and admire them all the time. <laughs> Just say to them, that's cool, that's fantastic, what is that? Can you do that again? Can you show me some more? She did that for two months. The scores went up to 50 which is what the posh schools of New Delhi with a trained biotechnology teacher were getting. <laughs> Across the River Tyne, 5,000 miles from Delhi, is the little town of Gateshead. In Gateshead, I took 32 children, and I started to, to fine-tune a method. I made them into groups of four. I said, you make your own groups of four. Each group of four can use one computer and not four computers. Remember from the hole in the wall. You can exchange groups, you can walk across to another group if you don't like your group, etc. You can go to another group, peer over their shoulders, see what they're doing, come back to your own group and claim it as your own work. And I explained to them that, you know, a lot of scientific research is done using that method. <laughs> <laughs> The children enthusiastically got after me to say, now what do you want us to do? I, I gave them six GCSE questions. The first group, the best one, solved everything in 20 minutes. The worst, in 45. They used everything that they knew. News groups, Google, Wikipedia, Ask Jeeves, etc. The teachers said, is this deep learning? I said, well, let's try it. I'll come back after two months. We'll give them a paper test, no computers, no talking to each other, etc. The average score when I'd done it with the computers and the groups was 76%. When I did the experiment, when I did the test after two months, the score was 76%. There was photographic recall inside the children. I suspect because they're discussing with each other. A single child in front of a single computer will not do that. I have further results which are almost unbelievable of scores which go up with time because their teachers say that after the session is over, the children continue to Google further. Back at Gates said, a 10-year-old girl gets into the heart of Hinduism in 15 minutes. You know, stuff which I don't know anything about. <laughs> Two children watch a TED talk. They wanted to be footballers before. After watching eight TED talks, he wants to become Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> It's, it's pretty simple stuff. This is what I'm building now. They're called souls, self-organized learning environments. The furniture is designed so that children can sit in front of big, powerful screens, big broadband connections, but in groups. If they want, they can call the granny cloud. This is a soul in Newcastle, 
The mediator is from Pune, India. So how far can we go? One last little bit and I'll stop. I went to Turin in May. I sent all the teachers away from a group of 10-year-old students. I speak only English, they speak only Italian. So we had no way to communicate. I started writing English questions on the blackboard. The children looked at it and said, what? I said, well, do it. They typed it into Google, translated it into Italian, went back into Italian Google. 15 minutes later... <laughs> Next question. Where is Calcutta? This one, they took only 10 minutes. I tried a really hard one then. Who was Pythagoras and what did he do? There was silence for a while. Then they said, you've spelled it wrong. It's Pythagora. <laughs> and then, in 20 minutes, the right angle triangles began to appear on the screen. It just sent shivers up my spine. These are 10 year olds. So you know what's happened? I think we've just stumbled across a self-organizing system. A self-organizing system is one where a structure appears without explicit intervention from the outside. Self-organizing systems also always show emergence, which is that the system starts to do things which it was never designed for, which is why you react the way you do, because it looks impossible. I think I can make a guess now. Education is a self-organizing system where learning is an emergent phenomenon. It'll take a few years to prove it experimentally, but I'm going to try. He actually did a second one, and he's done a third one. But the second one, in 2014, the TED organization initiated their, their inaugural uh, donation or award of $1 million to that person who could give a presentation that, that the audience and the reviewers felt would have the best chance of making change. And Sugata Mitra presented his idea of a cloud learning coming from the, uh, what he found in the hole in the wall. And he received the one, the, the one million dollar award. There's a lot to that, uh, as you can see, but I wanted to pull out some, um, what I feel are, are very important points. His theory about education is what he calls minimally invasive learning. He feels that learning is intrinsic to humans. Uh, that it's natural for us and we don't have to, and this is my word, we don't have to exoskeleton children to have learning happen. An exoskeleton is, is science future, futuristic thing um, and it's actually becoming real for people with paraplegia where you strap a person into the exoskeleton and then using their mind or using their hands they can actually cause it to walk them around. Now, um, if human beings required didactic teaching to do everything, then we would not be able to walk because we haven't had exoskeletons for the 10,000 years which, during which time babies have somehow been able to do it themselves. In fact, if you try and interfere with them, then they don't really get it. Uh, but we have come to believe that that's actually the way that learning should, should happen. It's didactic learning where the teacher has the knowledge and the teacher delivers the knowledge to the student. The, student, student, the knowledge enters the student and learning and understanding happens. We know we're changing from that, or nominally we're changing from that. Some are, some aren't. Um, so that's his idea, minimally invasive learning. Uh, also, you notice everywhere there, he feels that humans learn best through discovery learning. All of the examples we had were simply a big question, a question, and off the students go. And so that's really important. This is going to come up uh, continuously as we go through the syllabus. Uh, didactic teaching, what I mentioned, where the, where the teacher has the knowledge, that became necessary for the Industrial Revolution because there were specific ways of running machines and of uh, causing um, 
motors to work that had to be passed on and we've been using that reasonably successfully for some time but it is becoming less and less effective as environment and social life and work has changed and so discovery wording is better but what he, we saw there is how powerful group discovery learning is in fact you saw that he said that results actually went up after a month uh, and the reason was because the children kept on talking and, and amongst themselves. So those three things, minimally invasive learning, let the children, let human beings learn because we're built to do that. Discovery learning is the way to go about it. And didactic cheat teaching is no longer uh, uh, useful. We have to allow people to learn themselves through discovery learning. The other one that is not really related to the syllabus, but which is remarkable as well, is the story of how once the kids at that school had done their, their, their initial study of, of um, biotechnology and it ended up with 30%, then that he got this girl who was a friend of theirs and asked her to be involved. Now I've looked at the research on that and it's not simply her saying, oh you're fantastic, look how wonderfully you're doing, you guys are amazing. It's actually what is called uh, deep naive engagement. She comes in naive like a from birth baby with no knowledge more than them. Even if she has it, she, she doesn't use it to guide them. She is simply there to engage with them. But her job is to say, what would happen if you did that? Why did you do that? I'm wondering, you know, like why this and, and what would happen if that happened? And so that caused this remarkable 50% increase in outcomes. There was nothing else happening there. It was a, a, a closed environment for research and that changed the results by 50%. Um, now, the problem in our society is that, uh, and it, it, it's become the way of life, that the ideal people to do that are parents, but you can't get the parents to do it. I think I've shown something, I've got some information about that after this. But what he created was the granny cloud in England. He found, when he, he did this work in England, he got advertised for a group of retired people, he called them the granny cloud, to beam in to schools in India and be engaged with them as an interested other and also do some English learning with them. And if you ever, if you want to watch the full Sugata Mitra video, go onto YouTube and find it because you'll see the, um, the granny cloud at work there. In society as it is, parents do not have the time to do that anymore. Parents' engagement with children in their, uh, in their schoolwork drops and drops and drops from uh, kindergarten and keeps on dropping until they get to year 12. Parents are too busy to be involved. That's the nature of our society today. But what the people that, that perhaps have time are the grandparents. And the change in technology actually allows grandparents now to become involved. They can become involved through Skype. They don't actually even have to live with the children. And having a naive, interested grandparent, according to Sugata Mitra's research, can have dramatic effects on student outcomes. The syllabus mentions special needs and gifted and talented students and I haven't gone into the separate syllabus for that but what I want to uh, highlight is this overview of students with special education needs and this option that is available and a very uh, a valid one for primary school teachers and that is for acceleration promoting a student to a level of study beyond their age group so if you have some advanced students and you're trying to figure out what to do with them what you can do is you can read the year 7 to 8 syllabus it's it's strange but when I ran this course face to face I had both uh, primary and secondary school students teachers in the same rooms. They worked on separate strands, but I wanted them together because primary school teachers do not have a reason to read the secondary syllabus. And secondary teachers really uh, don't have the faintest interest in what happens at primary school. Primary do because you have, you're preparing for the secondary school. And yet, uh, if you're looking at a way to promote, uh, to, to accelerate students, Moving them on to year 7, 8 in the secondary syllabus is very valid and just in technology you might look at things like coding in a text-based language which you don't do there but it's part, built in to the secondary syllabus and similarly secondary students should have the primary syllabus in front of them for their uh, special needs syllabus 
so that they can help, the, they can decide, well, what we'll do is we'll let them actually address part of the stage three syllabus, uh, even though they're in stage four. So I'm suggesting that it is really a good idea to have a copy of the secondary syllabus in uh, your school and be aware of what it actually, the options it gives you for uh, talented students. Um, and special needs students, of course, you know the entire syllabus, so you know, of course, you can, I mean, you do this all the time with, with a, a stage three student. You can say, well, what we'll do is we'll allow them to spend more time on stage two. We're going to go on to the syllabus objectives, the goals. And uh, we'll use the term objectives rather than the organization theory term goals. And where do they fit in? After the vision statement and mission statement, Statements of strategy, the goals, objectives, actions, and action plans are given to break down into detail how the mission will achieve the vision. The goals are generated based on what the syllabus wants to achieve. So what happens is that you have your vision and the mission says how you're going to achieve it, and that's broken down into your goals. These are very important. They're actually saying, what, do we, what will we see when, when we achieve what we want to from the syllabus? And you can then go look at your outcomes, uh, and the outcomes should match what you say in your goals. Because if they don't, then you're not going to be able to assess whether you've achieved your goals or not. Let's have a look at the goals. So, the syllabus is broken down in some somewhat complex ways. So, it's broken down into two generic areas and four content-specific areas, the objectives of the goals. Let's call them objectives. The generic areas, you'll find that there are outcomes, identical outcomes for these within each of the knowledge and understanding. So living world, material world, physical world, earth and space, digital technologies, you'll find these working scientifically design and production um, outcomes, and we're actually talking at a high level of objectives, they feature all the way through it. So the generic areas, um, the generic objectives you're supposed to be aware of and, and your program should include them in each of the strands that you're teaching. So uh, they, they, they stand above all of them. And so you will find yourself including them in living world, material world. And then the objectives of each of the strands are what do you want your children to achieve, to know uh, from the knowledge and understanding from those strands. That's a useful diagram. Um, it does, I think it, it, it's not a perfect job, but it does help uh, understand a bit more about how the syllabus is structured. So, uh, let me just go back to that. Um, so, under the objectives, we have skills objectives, and then we have knowledge and understanding. And notice to the side, the thinking skills, uh, they actually aren't li listed as such in the objectives. They, they kind of stand alone and you're supposed to think well I think I'll include this one here and I think I'll include that one there and there is are some suggestions on where you might or might not include them but it's more or less up to you so there's skills objectives and then their knowledge and understanding objectives the skills objectives are broken down further into working scientifically and design and production so there you have it uh, oh and let's just go back again and also into uh, digital outcomes. So let's carry on. Design and production of digital solutions. So I suppose it's a specific area of design and production. So there they are. Uh, the skills are scientific, in, they develop skills in scientific inquiry through working scientifically, design and production processes in the development of solutions, and design and production of digital solutions. And in knowledge and understanding, they develop knowledge and understanding of the natural world, including living things, materials, forces, energy, Earth and space, those are the strands. And the built environment, including engineering principles and systems, food and fiber and material technologies, and then digital technologies. So all of, actually, all of those are the strands. And now the third one is values and attitudes. And these are the values and attitudes. These are goals. These are what we want our students to uh, show at the end, uh, show that they have, uh, that they, they reflect, that, that, that they um, use and, and value these values and attitudes value the importance and contribution of science and technology in developing solutions for current and future personal, social, global issues and in shaping a sustainable future. 
hopefully uh, students, today's students will um, come to value that and persuade uh, the uh, politicians that they should value it too. Appreciate the importance of engaging with and responding to scientific and technological ideas using evidence and reason as citizens who are informed and reflective and value developing solutions to problems and meeting changes through the application of working scientifically and design and production skills. So those seem to be some good goals. Let's see whether they follow through into the outcomes and uh, into the way the content is phrased. We'll see that later on. And then the skills productions, the skills objectives, so those were the values and attitudes, the skills objectives are broken down further into working scientifically and design and production. So just recapping the thinking skills we've covered separately, they sit, they sit within uh, the others wherever you, you are able to use them. And then there are skills and knowledge and understanding and we're looking at the breakdown of the skills. We've looked at the, uh, and we also looked at values and attitudes. And now we're going to look further at the breakdown of the skills into working scientifically and design and production. The working scientifically skills objectives. The overview, they're at the core of inquiry and developed by conducting practical investigations and research in science and technology. When investigating opportunities are, when investigating, opportunities are to be provided for students to engage with all of the working scientifically skills. Students develop an understanding that the working scientifically processes are applied in a way that is determined by the task. The student develops an understanding that the working scientifically processes are more than a series of predictable steps that confirm what we know. Working scientifically challenges students to imagine and pose questions, develop processes that can be used to solve problems, and explain observations uh, and phenomena. The scientific processes are informed by the unexpected. An unexpected result. No observable change does not necessarily indicate that an investigation was not successful. That's an important point that we've raised before, but rather can be used to direct further questioning and scientific investigation. So instead of saying, oh, my idea was wrong, what we say is, oh, good, I've been able to eliminate another line of inquiry, therefore I can focus it more precisely. An investigation is a scientific process of answering a question, exploring an idea, or solving a problem that includes practical activities such as planning a course of action, using fair testing and replication, collection and interpretation of data, reaching a conclusion, conclusion and communicating findings. So, to design units of work that achieve working scientifically skills objectives, it's necessary to know what the syllabus considers working scientifically skills to be. This is expanded on the syllabus and on the following pages. So just let's go back and you'll see that's an overview of what working scientifically is. It doesn't actually tell you what these skills are. It just says this is what they'll be doing when they're working scientifically. So what do you actually see them doing? That's broken down further. Into these four components. So if you're working scientifically, you're doing these things. You're questioning and predicting, planning and conducting investigations, processing and analyzing data, and then communicating. What I've done is I've tried to break those, structure those more precisely because, <clears throat> as I said before, when we read text like that, um, we, we, we kind of make assumptions in our own brain and miss what the structure is actually requiring us to do. So let's break it down and have a look at it. Oh, first of all, just point out that there's a continuum of learning, learning tables. They provide these for us, which are very useful because they tell us what's the progress of the, what, what is the expected progress in students' um, activities and outcomes uh, as they go from early, early one to stage one to stage two to stage three. And they give us a continuum in questioning, predicting, planning and conducting investigations, processing, analyzing data and communicating. And it says we're not covering content yet, but wish to point out that the continuum of learning tables include references to the relevant Australian curriculum content descriptors. And you can see there they're XDEP015, APDEC025. And as I mentioned earlier, and you'll find in the, in the content, the New South Wales syllabus content does not go into deep 
uh, detail on how you what you can actually do in applying this content or in programming this content. It's designed so that you then rely on the Australian syllabus to give you ideas um, and expand it further. And that's why they've given us these links. So the content elaborations and the teaching resources are located at those curriculum content descriptor pages. And you'll find I've given you uh, in your resources uh, a means of linking directly to each of those from the, from the, uh, the objective and the outcome. So let's have a look at these. Oh, that that's shows you what, uh, what you find when you click on that link. It takes you to the Scootle website. That's in our system. That's where it uh, has the elaborations. And then actual uh, the elaborations and then actual resources. So listed down below there are the resources under, you see data representation and here is the resource. You can find out about data representation and you can click and view details of your resource. There's information about algorithms and game-based learning. So Scootle uh, enlarges on the content and then also actually gives you resources. So now we'll look at the breakdown of those four working scientifically skills. And remember the first one was questioning and predicting, and this is what was in that text, but I broke it down to, to show what it actually structures as, and it says, students question and make predictions about familiar events and outcomes of investigations. So they're questioning and making predictions about familiar events and outcomes of investigations. They pose relevant questions to initiate a scientific investigation and predict outcomes to unfamiliar situations. And there's the continuum of learning. And what I did was I highlighted in color where things replicate themselves. So you can see post questions about familiar objects and events, respond to questions about familiar objects and events. Now that continues on into stage two, but it's slightly phrased uh, slightly differently for respond to questions. So the first one is about familiar objects and events, but in, this, but in stage one now, uh, the students are not given the advantage of it being a familiar object and event, it's now more broad and coming in in stage one is make predictions about possible findings. Then stage two, that pose has actually been enlarged to identify and pose questions in, instead of about familiar objects, it's in familiar contexts that can be investigated scientifically and then make predictions is there again but it's based on prior knowledge and finally, in stage three, we still have pose questions, but they're now testable questions. And we have them make predictions, but it's make and justify predictions about new things, scientific investigation. So you can see there uh, the continuum and to make it easier to actually pick up where new things are appearing and what the changes are, uh, I've used color to help with that. The next one is planning and conducting investigations. Students explore their surroundings and develop strategies for planning, conducting fair testing. They work collaboratively and individually. That's important. So this is actually there in the gold, collaboratively and individually. And uh, we'd like to see in the outcomes that they have shown a, a, a growth in their ability to work collaboratively and individually. Uh, what are they working for? To plan appropriate investigations, test predictions and find answers to questions. So students make observations using their senses and use measurement and appropriate technologies. So they have measurement and appropriate technologies to collect and record these observations. They use appropriate materials, tools and equipment. So there are different things, materials, tools and equipment. And recognize risks in conducting practical investigations. And here is the continuum for planning and conducting investigations. The third one is processing and analyzing data. Students organize, share, that's interesting, you have to share and compare data and information. They engage with a range, of, now what does share mean? That's, that, that's interesting, does it mean share with you, the teacher, or share amongst themselves? They engage with a range of representations, including graphs, tables, and labeled diagrams. So that's quite, quite clearly spelled out. Students discuss observations and use reasoning to describe patterns and relationships. 
They develop mathematical skills to represent data, justify conclusions, and share their findings. Students analyze their findings and reflect on the effectiveness of the investigation by assessing the reliability and validity of the data collected. Well, what's the difference between reliability and validity? Uh, there must be a difference because otherwise it wouldn't have been separated off into two things. So that's an interesting question. In fact, what I would ask my students to do, I'd say, look, um, I guess it's more for year for, for stage three. Um, the goals say we have to uh, check the reliability and the validity, and I don't know what the difference between those is. Can you please go and look up the definition and tell me what we're looking for so we make sure that we are checking the right things? And here's the continuum. And finally, communicating skills. Students communicating by using and constructing a range of representations including tables and graphs. So I guess that, that means, to me that means they can use other people's and construct their own. Because if it said and cons by constructing and using, it means that they only use their own. So there they can use and they can construct a range of representations including tables and graphs. So they can look them up on the web or and make their own. To represent and describe, represent and then describe observations and identify relationships in data using appropriate technologies. They uh, share and communicate their obs observations. Share and communicate. Again, share and communicate their observations. I think share means actually share with other people because otherwise if it's just to us as teachers, that's communicating. And what are they sharing as observations and ideas in a variety of ways to explain processes and their understandings of concepts. So those are the objectives, uh, the skills objectives that we are trying to achieve through teaching this syllabus. The students should exhibit those skills after they've gone through and our uh, outcomes should provide us the, uh, the information to create assessments to assess these. And there's the um, continuum. So what I'd like you to do at this point, pause the material and referring to the continuum of learning for the working scientific skills and objectives, discuss in your group whether this continuum of learning will inform collaborative development between teachers of different stages of the units of work and lesson plans. I guess, sorry for phrasing that in a very convoluted way, what I meant was, if you go through this, um, and, and really what the purpose of asking you to do this in groups is that you're going to work together to create your programs and units of work is this information if you go through and look at it again is it going to change your ideas on how you're going to teach it have you already decided that everything you had decided about it fitted into that and you you, you really didn't even need to go through it um, does it give you new ideas does it highlight some things and not others are you looking forward to seeing the outcomes to see whether they measure these things that are in the goals? So I would like, invite you to actually go through it and discuss with yourself what part of these uh, scientific, working scientifically skills objectives going to play in, uh, in your design of your program. And when you finish that, then come back to this video. We've looked at the working scientifically skills. Now let's have a look at the design and production skills objectives. So they're the objectives related to acquiring these skills. What we'd like to see, uh, the goals of what we'd like to see when these skills are acquired. So here's the overview again. The practical nature of design and production engages students in critical and creative thinking. So uh, they don't include analytical thinking, but I guess analytical thinking actually, those two fit into analytical thinking. Perhaps analytical thinking includes other things as well. Because if you're thinking creatively, you have to think analytically, and if you're thinking critically, you certainly have to think analytically. 
So it includes critical and creative thinking, including understanding interrelationships between systems. Right. So it's systems thinking as they solve complex problems. So it engages students in those things as they solve complex problems. Students develop skills to uh, plan, organize, and monitor activities and processes. So there wasn't much purpose in using different colors there. Let's just go. So the colors might have been distracting. Students develop skills to plan, organize, and monitor activities and processes as they manage projects to completion. Plan, organize, and monitor. So they have to prepare, plan them first, and they have to plan first, and then organize. Now we might think that organizing is planning, but actually it isn't. They they've said that it's separate, and then monitor, which is keep track of what's happening. So that breakdown is quite important. We might have missed that if we just read plan, organize, and monitor. But they're three separate steps. And what are they doing? That two their activities and the processes. Activities are different from processes. What processes? Is it the processes of, the, of, the, of what they're designing or their own processes? Uh, unanswered questions, and it's good they're unanswered. We figure out what they mean. As they manage projects to completion, students are taught to plan for the sustainable use of resources and identify the benefits and potential risks of solutions. So. That, uh, I think those are, are two separate things. It's not a, uh, they're not linked. So to plan for the sustainable use of resources and identify the benefits and potential risks of solutions. Design and production provides students with opportunities to consider how solutions will be used to create preferred futures. That implies they need to have some understanding of what preferred futures is. Part of that video that you watched before uh, engaging with this part of the course. And as with the working scientifically skills, to create those units of work, you have to actually know what those skills are. Let's go back and see. This is really just an overview of what, it, of what they're engaged in, but it doesn't actually tell you what they're doing when they're using design and production skills, really. That's what the outcome will be. So what are the design and production skills? And here they are. Firstly, identifying and defining, researching and planning and testing and evaluation. We don't need to read those through because once again I've, um, unstru I've unstructured them or structured them, decom decom destructured them. I can't remember the term I use. So the first is identifying and defining. Students consider the contribution of technologies to their lives. They make judgments about them and explore needs and opportunity for designing. They question and review existing products, processes and systems. They explore needs or opportunities for designing. Define problems to be solved. Describe to solve the problem the sequence of steps and designs and algorithms. Sorry, and decisions and algorithms. And establish criteria for a successful design solution. And there's the continuum of learning, which I've done the same, uh, break it down into colors so you can see how it is progressing from stage to stage. And the next one is researching and planning. Students identify factors that may influence and dictate two separate meanings. Uh, so students will have to differentiate between those, influence and dictate, the focus of the design idea. Explore options and represent and refine ideas. They investigate materials, components, tools, equipment, and or processes. Each of those being different. To achieve intended design solutions. They generate, develop, and communicate design ideas and information. Using appropriate technical terms and graphical representations. They develop project plans that include consideration of resources and they design modify and follow simple algorithms and steps in the development of a design solution. I like their use of the word algorithms there because you'll see when we get on to uh, what we did when we, when we looked at computational thinking. An algorithm is a series of steps to achieve an outcome. 
uh, it's misunderstood as being related only to computing, but it's not. When you bake a cake, when your students bake a cake, they're following an algorithm. They are acquiring, the, so the algorithm says, uh, obtain this, obtain this, obtain this, do that, uh, set temperature, oven to something. In fact, with today's technology, you can actually write a computer program with those algorithms and the stove will do exactly what you want and the little ordering robot will, will go and order it from um, Woolworths online delivery. So that's translating the algorithm into something used by a computer. But there you can see uh, they follow simpler algorithms. They don't have to be computer algorithms. In fact, they aren't. This says it steps in the development of a design solution. And here is the continuum. Then, finally, producing and implementing, students develop and apply a variety of skills and techniques to create products, services, or environments to meet specific purposes. They select and use materials, components, tools, equipment, and processes to safely produce design solutions. Students implement digital solutions using visual programs. Now that variety of skills and techniques that they're developing and applying, that's what we saw in the previous one. So uh, we've seen what those skills and techniques are. And there is the continuum for producing and implementing. And finally, testing and evaluating. Students evaluate their design ideas, processes and solutions. Well, it doesn't say theirs. It just says evaluates design ideas, processes and solutions to inform decision making about the quality and effectiveness of design solutions. They determine effective ways to test and judge design solutions against predetermined criteria. So, uh, yeah, well, against what? Predetermined criteria. That's important, they must be predetermined. You, you figure out what it is you're going to use to, as your test and they become your predetermined criteria. They reflect on processes and transfer their learning to other design opportunities. Students explore how people use information systems to meet needs and opportunities. Uh, these processes are um, of interest to me. This little device that I use here to switch from slide to side is actually uh, a portable interactive whiteboard. That little bit over there at the top is an infrared, um, uh, uh, gener generates an infrared light. These little buttons I can use as mice or as a whiteboard tool and it's from the early days of interactive whiteboards when schools couldn't afford them and also I needed something on my courses that I could bring with me and it used a little infrared detector linked in with software that mapped it to the screen and I could actually use it as uh, an interactive whiteboard like my finger on the smart board to drag things across the screen um, to use a left and right mouse button and that I designed and then had it manufactured in China so I had to go through all of these steps myself to achieve that design. And there's the continuum for testing and evaluating. So at this point, pause is material and referring again to the continuum of learning this time for the design and production skills. Discuss in your group whether this continuum of learning will inform collaborative development between teachers of different stages of units of work and lesson plans. I guess now thinking of what I meant was the continuum, because in primary school you, you all cover all areas, uh, the continuum, and you all sit together to, to work out your plans, the continuum of learning, I guess, is, is uh, can you use that to figure out how to go from year to year to year, as well as how do you think these goals are going to inform the way you design your programs, your units of work and your lesson plans um, to include them and also how you're going to assess for them. And hopefully we're, we're anxiously waiting to see what the outcomes say, whether they give us guidance on how to assess these. They, they better because these are goals, these are visions, this is what we're supposed to do and if actually down at the assessment end there's no way of telling, of assessing whether the students are achieving these things or not, then there's some kind of disconnect between the vision and the mission and the goals 
and the action plans for the assessments. So let's, we'll see as we get on further. So if you can take your time to have a look at that.